Well, good morning and welcome to church. Well, you may or may not realise it, but this is our final Sunday morning together before we can actually meet together once more in the church building. And so I just want to take you on a little bit of a guided tour as to, to what will take place when you arrive at the church. And so I'm just going to spin this around. And so as you come in towards the church, you'll either come down through here or you'll come down through the ramp there. Whichever way you come, as you come in, you'll start to see some blue crosses on the ground. Someone said the other day that someone's been kissing the ground. Well, they may be, but uh, this is the one and a half metres gap between each person. So as you come in, wait at each spot until you get inside the door here. And as you come in the door, there's another blue spot, or cross, and you'll come in and you'll sign in. First of all, wipe your hands with the sanitizer, fill in the, the details. This isn't for the church, this is for the government to keep a record that if we have an outbreak, uh, we know who's been into the church and at what times. Please bring your own pens with you. We have a couple here, but if you bring your own, we don't have to worry about cross-contamination. If you're visiting the church for the first time, we ask if you can fill out one of these uh, little cards with your details. We can't take your details off this form. So if you fill out your details there, just put it inside the other box and I'll collect them after the service. Once you've filled it out, you'll come into the church. This is what it looks like. It's a bit messy at the moment because we've been having Bible studies and things like that in here as well. That'll all be tidied up. As you can see, the chairs are all one and a half metres apart at the moment. And so when you sit down, you can sit in family groups. But then if you sit beside a family group, make sure you have one and a half metres gap between you and the next group of people. We should be able to fit up to 50 people in here. By the regulations, we're allowed 50. We can probably even take one or two more because we have the, the back area here, but we have to keep the one and a half metre square, uh, sorry, the four metre square rule, one and a half metres separate a rule from one another. So as you come in, come straight in and don't walk around touching things because that just brings more contamination um, possibly. And so take your seat, chat to the people around you but don't move around. Try not to grab hold of the chairs as you walk past. Don't come in and do this. Unless, of course, you're unsteady on your feet, then we can understand. We'll then have the, the service. Things will look a little bit different from normal. Um, there won't be any Sunday school for the moment either until we figure out numbers and how we're going to make that work. The only person up on stage for the time being will be myself, mainly because... I don't want to have to keep wiping things down every time someone comes up and touches something. So everyone will be sitting down in around here. At the end of the service, a couple of people will come around wearing gloves and they will be carrying these wipes. We ask that you take a wipe, wipe down your spot where you've sat. That way it saves somebody having to go through and do a proper full clean afterwards. That can then take place later on during the week if need be. Wipe down your area. There'll be bins around the place for you to put your, um, the sanitizer into. Again, once you've wiped down your area, don't touch any place. Otherwise, we're just going to have to wipe it down a second time or a third time. Proceed back out the door and out into the car park. If you want to uh, hang around and talk to people, please do so outside. It makes it much easier to keep things clean. Um, again, keeping the, the four square metre rule and staying one and a half metres from each other. We are allowed to have singing during the service. There will be singing during the service. Outside of that, church will be fairly normal for the time being. There won't be morning tea afterwards uh, because we can't keep um, up the regulations with that at the moment. So. That will uh, happen again sometime down the track. Well, there you have it. That's um, what things will look like when you come back next week. We'll be recording the, the services, uh, just the, the message side of it. Having said that, it won't be going live at the time. 
So next week, um, I'll have up another uh, sermon from somebody within the Baptist Union. So if you can't make it to church this coming uh, coming Sunday, uh, you can watch that. Hopefully sometime in the afternoon, um, possibly even Monday, the video will go up uh, of the sermon and then we'll continue to do that each week until we can all be together once again. Um, having said that, we'll probably actually continue um, taping the service or the, the sermons each week and putting them up online because we know that there's always people that can't always make it for various reasons. Well, enjoy the service this morning and we look forward to seeing you in person next time you can make it here. God bless. Well, good morning, church. It's uh, good to be with you, sharing on this occasion. Uh, greeting on greetings to you on behalf of Queensland Baptist. I want to talk a little bit uh, in this time uh, about the issue of contentment. You know, um, there's times in our life when things just don't go right. There's times when we have bad days and uh, times when we have extended periods uh, where things just aren't going right. And I'm the first to admit that when things aren't good or when we're uncomfortable or I'm uncomfortable or facing some challenge in life, it's hard to feel contentment. Uh, as I look around uh, people, it, it seems that there is uh, definitely a, a lack of contentment in, in our society today. And, and, and that was uh, something I was noticing even before uh, COVID-19 hit. If we look at contentment, uh, one definition of contentment is a state of happiness, uh, but it also uh, ha carries with it this idea of satisfaction and fulfilment. Uh, with COVID-19 particularly uh, hitting us and the social distancing uh, measures and the health directives and not being able to gather and being uh, urged to stay and work from home, I think it's put a lot of us under pressure. Relational pressure, financial pressure, emotional uh, pressure. Uh, help and, and counselling lines are, are reporting that there's been a large increase in you know, people wanting to wanting help. One of the things I've found uh, that has, has uh, certainly increased the feeling of uh, discontentment is with body image, with, with the way we look. And this has come around because of, of Zoom meetings uh, and uh, online video conferencing, which has meant that people are looking at themselves in meetings. When you think about it, in a normal meeting, face-to-face -face meeting with people, you're looking at the other pe people in the room and you're focused on them and, and uh, engaging with them. But with, Z with the online videoing conferencing, uh, you're actually looking at yourself. And so they've actually found that most people are focusing on themselves in video conferencing. And so uh, some online retail stores have actually recorded massive increases in the sale of beauty products. 520% increase for Maya in uh, beauty uh, products. A 600% increase in the sale of skincare products. Uh, all of this is pointing to, uh, uh, I think, suggesting that uh, evidence for a, a lack of contentment, particularly with how we might be looking and, and viewing ourselves. So uh, as we think about COVID-19 and the health restrictions and, and the things that we might be going to, uh, I think that the circumstances we find ourselves in can have a big impact on our levels of, of contentment. In fact, it's easy to look at our circumstances and blame them for discontentment that we might feel. For most people, I think that there's this expectation that if our circumstances are right, I'll feel uh, contented. 
Uh, and so for a lot of people, uh, contentment is something that eludes them simply because their circumstances uh, aren't working out as they, they may have expected. Others, in, in an attempt uh, to uh, achieve contentment, might try and control their circumstances uh, to find that contentment. Now, we might uh, uh, think that if only I had this look, or if only I had these features, if only my skin was flawless, if, but, you know, if only I had that job, if, if only I had that girlfriend or boyfriend or that relationship, or if only I had that car, if only I had that position, then I would be content. And in this uh, season that we're in, it could be as simple as if only I could see my friends, if only I could get to my, my home group and, and meet them physically, if only the kids would go to school, if only I could get to the shops, then I'd be content once again. And so I think we have this default notion that our circumstances in life will determine our level of contentment. But it's not so when we, when we look at what the Apostle Paul says about this issue of contentment. And so I want to have a look at uh, in Philippians chapter 4 and just some, share some thoughts and some insights from the Apostle Paul from the book of Philippians chapter 4 uh, verse 10 to 11 says this, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. That's the statement I want to focus on for a minute. Paul says, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So for Paul, uh, contentment wasn't tied to his circumstances, but it was something that he learned. Now, we might think that contentment's uh, easier when things are going our way and, and we can experience it for a time. Perhaps there's something we've longed for and worked hard for that might bring us a sense of fulfillment and, and contentment. Uh, perhaps a higher paying job or, or a new toy or some grades, uh, good grades at school or uni or a new relationship. But even in, when we get what we want and even when we uh, feel that things are going well, contentment can still elude us. And for many, contentment is tied to wealth or success, thinking that money can bring contentment, particularly because with money, you might be able to control your circumstances. Uh, but there's uh, been studies done, uh, and, and one of the surveys uh, that was done about this uh, surveyed the richest uh, Americans and the poorest Maasai herdsmen in Africa who are living on less than a dollar a day. And the thing that they found was that the contentment levels, their happiness levels, weren't that different, regardless of income. And so uh, when we think that things are going our way and, and perhaps we, we have some sense of control, a ten, a contentment can still elude us. Uh, it could, even wealth seems not to be able to bring contentment. And so this, is, this reinforces what I think the Apostle Paul is saying here is that you can't earn your way to contentment. You can't just fall into contentment. Real and lasting contentment is something that has to be learned. Now, the Greek word that the Apostle Paul uses for learned is, is, uh, has in its range of meaning to um, come to an understanding, uh, to gain skill, uh, but also to be instructed, to be initiated, and to, to uh, uh, come to the knowledge of an inner secret. When you think about it, we have to learn lots of things in life, don't we? I mean, the, I've got uh, four grandchildren and I've watched them learn to walk. You know, they, they crawl and, and then they learn to stand up and then they learn to walk. I watched my uh, oldest granddaughter learn to ride a bike, which was quite difficult for her at times and sometimes painful. I had to learn to drive a car. Uh, as an as a, a apprentice boilermaker, I had to learn how to weld, you know. Now, we might have certain dispositions and aptitudes that make some things easier, but there are a few things in life that just happen apart from effort and practice. We have to learn those things. And contentment, according to the Apostle Paul, is one of the things we have to learn. So just as you don't wake up one morning slim and fit, or you don't drift into godly habits and spiritual disciplines, you don't suddenly find yourself in contentment. It's something we have to learn. It doesn't just happen. We have to work at it. We have to deliberately choose it. True contentment is something 
we learn. And we can learn, when we learn contentment, we're not tied to our circumstances. Now, I want to say uh, that there's a, a point here to bring out that the contentment is not learned by ignoring or denying our needs. Uh, the Apostle Paul says this in Philippians 4, 14 to 16. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, you Philippians know that the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. So the context for Philippians 4 is, is uh, Paul, in this particular chapter, is Paul sharing with the Philippians uh, and encouraging them in, in this uh, ministry of giving and how he's been blessed by that and, and encouraging them to continue in that. But Paul was not some masochist who loved hardship. You know, he's honest there. He's saying he talks about sharing in his troubles. He talks about when he was in need. Uh, now, Paul was willing to suffer and be faithful to Jesus and to share the good news about Jesus. He knew there was a cost to that, but he didn't go around looking for trouble. Um, you know, pain and trouble were not things that brought him contentment. Paul loved freedom. He loved life. He enjoyed traveling and sharing the, the good news and the freedom to be able to do that uh, with all kinds of people. He had good times helping people and following Jesus, and he was content in that. But he also knew what it was like to suffer. In fact, he wrote Philippians from prison. And that would have been hard. Prisons in those days were a lot tougher than they might be today. He was not denying the pain and suffering, but he was still able to say, in the spite of his circumstances, whether good or bad, even in a prison cell, that he experienced contentment. Contentment is found not in enjoying or uh, pain or suffering or pretending everything's okay. Uh, contentment is a secret that's learned when we rest in the all-sufficient power of Jesus. Contentment is found in the all-sufficient power of Jesus. This is what uh, Paul says in verse 12 and 13, chapter 4 in Philippians. I know what it is, uh, is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Paul learned the secret of contentment in the school of life, in the, the hustle and bustle, in the good times and in the difficult times. And so contentment for him wasn't conditional upon his looks or his circumstances, whether he's free or a prisoner. He experienced suffering and need, but he also experienced times of ease and plenty. And Paul found that it can be just as hard to be content in the good times as it can be in the bad. So he learned the secret of contentment. That irrespective of his external circumstances, he discovered that contentment is found in resting and trusting in the all-surpassing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, contentment comes through knowing Jesus and trusting him for all that we need. This is actually one of the most liberating truths uh, of the New Testament, that we don't need to be slaves to our circumstances. And Paul's saying that there is no circumstances that can in fact rob him of contentment because of the power of Jesus being present in his life and a reality for him. And so Paul can say things like this in Philippians 1.21. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then in Philippians 3.8, he says this, what is more, I consider everything a loss comparing compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things, and I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ. The contentment for Paul was about having joy and satisfaction, uh, being rested, being at peace in Jesus Christ, regardless of his circumstances. Paul had hidden resources that gave him strength, and contentment in all circumstances. You know, think of the analogy of, of a tree, like a, a, this big tree, and the roots go down. You can't see the roots. The most significant part of the tree is actually under the ground. The roots, 
that give stability, to give groundedness, uh, to give the, the, the tree the ability to stand regardless of the forces and circumstances around it. And I think this is what the Apostle Paul is, in, is saying and I want to encourage us with today. That the root system of our spiritual life as followers of Jesus, when we're grounded and planted in him, can give us strength and nourishment, uh, restedness and peace, uh, regardless of our circumstances. The roots of our life in God through Jesus can sustain us through all circumstances, if those roots are strong and healthy. And so, understanding what the Paul, uh, Apostle Paul here is saying and uh, that he'd learned the secret of contentment. When we learn the secret of contentment, our circumstances move from robbing us of contentment to being teachers of contentment. And so it's not what we're going through that's most important for us, but how we view it. And asking the question, who is God for me in this moment? What are you looking for in contentment? In this time of, of social isolation, when we're under pressure and when, uh, when life is far from normal and we might be uh, stressed and, and have some level of anxiety, what brings you contentment? What helps you to be rested? When we're trusting uh, in Jesus, regardless of the circumstances we face, we can actually have lasting and real contentment. Warren Worsby, a uh, biblical commentator, says that when it comes to circumstances, there's two kinds of people. There's thermometer people and there's thermostat people. Thermometer people, uh, like thermometers, are just reflecting what's around them, the temperature of the room, if you like. They're reflecting the circumstances and reacting to them. Whereas thermostat people seek to remain constant no matter what the circumstances and so I want to encourage you today to learn the secret of contentment by resting in the all-surpassing power of Jesus Christ. That you can be a thermostat person in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of challenge and pressure. And so my prayer for us today is, Lord, teach us contentment in all that we're facing right now. And Lord Jesus, may we choose to be content in you and make contentment in you our focus. May we focus not on the circumstances that we're facing, but on you, Lord Jesus, knowing that through your presence and power, we can have peace and we can have a sense of fulfillment and a sense of contentment. And that that will be speaking volumes to those around us. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for your all-surpassing power. And thank you that through these circumstances we might be facing, you can help us be more like you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.